started. Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to the CEO seminar. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Susan Ansel, who is the Director of Water uh, Lawn Water Planning for EPCAR Water Service Services in Edmonton, Alberta. Alberta. Uh, prior to that, she was the Director of Stormwater Strategies, where she was <clears throat> responsible for developing an integrated resource plan for uh, flood mitigation, uh, considering capital and operational risk mitigation planning, as well as the interrelationships between utilities, insurance, disaster response agencies, and public. Uh, prior to that, she was a director of water distribution and transmission for EPCAR. Uh, Susan is a mechanical engineer with over 30 years of experience with the municipal utility sector. Uh, she has served on numerous industry committees, including the Board of Directors for the Geospatial Information Technology Association from 2001 to 2007, and was the president of uh, GITA in 2006. And she is currently serves in the Board of Directors for Canadian Water Network. So it's great to have you uh, with us today, Susan. And with that, uh, I welcome you to present. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to give an overview presentation of our stormwater integrated resource plan uh, that we developed in Edmonton over the last few years. Uh, we've won a, a ton of awards recently uh, for the initiative, uh, most recent being the Clean 50 uh, Project Award for 2021. Uh, and so getting a lot of recognition for our approach, which incorporates a number of different techniques into a comprehensive strategy for stormwater management in the community. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the slide deck in terms of some of the different aspects that we looked at, um, what were some of the conclusions that came out of it, and how our framework uh, was developed, um, and hopefully give you information as you're working forward in other communities, you can leverage some of those techniques going forward. So in terms of um, the objective of our project was really, it was about trying to reduce the risk of flooding in Edmonton due to extreme weather, considering the impacts of climate change. Um, we had a number of objectives in terms of identifying the areas that were at the highest risk of an impact from stormwater flooding. Uh, we wanted to develop our programs to effectively address these program risks, but also have a strong emphasis on how we can work with the homeowners uh, in terms of the actions that they can take um, to uh, protect their properties, uh, considering that that's on the private side of the property. And so a lot of that is, is requiring their investments. So how we could best work together. Uh, in early, um, sort of mid-2017, uh, what did happen in Edmonton is the drainage utility shifted from being a municipal department and moved over to EPCOR. And so EPCOR, um, we're owned by the city of Edmonton, but we operate like a private utility. Uh, and so as part of that transition, we had a number of commitments with our city council to deliver on this, uh, um, these objectives. Uh, and as part of that, uh, we were in front of city council quite a bit, of, uh, a number of times as we were presenting our materials. And I, I give these dates here because all of these materials and presentations are available publicly from the city of Edmonton's uh, utility committee website. Uh, and so if you want to dive into anything deeper on any of these topics, you can access this material here, deeper presentations on any one of these topics. Um, and, and basically, uh, that's one of the principles of Edmonton is open government. And so all of their committee meetings are recorded and available for, for uh, review at a later date uh, with all the supporting materials. Um, and so part of our approach was to sort of bring utility committee and city council along the journey as we were exploring different aspects of stormwater management. And so each of these dates has a different theme. Um, so the first part in, in 2018, we introduced the concept of IRP. Uh, we also did a session on insurance in April of 2018. And we also just recently in August of 2021, revisited that topic with utility committee. June 2018 was all about our risk framework and how we were going to approach it. Um, October was about public priorities and how um, the risk ranking pulled out. And then May of 2019 was the development of our capital program. 
Um, so again, if anybody wants more information on that, and the slide deck I'm going to go through today is, is pretty much the highlights from all these different presentations that we did. So just little snippets of, of the content of, of what we developed. So first of all, uh, introducing the concept of integrated resource planning, um, not a you know, some people are aware of it, some people aren't of it as, as a planning technique. It is different than traditional master planning. Um, and it is from the perspective of, um, just a second, I'm going to close the polling question that popped up. Um, so in terms of um, what integrated resource planning technique is a way of expanding your horizons of what you think your design constraints are. And so it's, it's a, a formalized process where you look at, for example, in the case of stormwater, um, often you'll hear the conversation be, you know, should we design to a one in 50 year storm or a one in 100 year storm? And so the question that you would ask on an IRP perspective is what is the purpose of that design standard? And so a, a one in 100 year storm is a 1% risk of, of flooding occurring or, or damage due to flooding to a particular property. So from an IRP approach, we ask the question, okay, what are the different ways that we can achieve a 1% uh, risk of flooding in any one year? So it opens up your mind to thinking about different alternatives than the traditional piped approaches. The other piece it does is it, it opens up the concept of working across what we call the public-private divide. And so doing techniques with the private property and the private citizen. So it's not just all about the public infrastructure coming up with the solution. Um, IRP techniques originally ar arose out of the power industry and were used about um, looking at different ways to influence the way people are using power to avoid expenditures for large dams. Uh, in EPCOR, we've used IRP since 1993, um, primarily on the water side is where we started. And through that approach, we reduced per capita water consumption in Edmonton uh, from a high of 270 liters per person per day, where now we're at about 160 liters per person per day. And our peak hour has not increased at all, despite a 40% increase in population. And so it is a very powerful technique to change the inputs into your, your design problem. Just uh, this line here. So one of the first things that we did as, as we started with our project was a fairly extensive literature review to look at what were the different techniques that other cities were using in terms of flood mitigation in their communities. Um, we looked also at what the city of Edmonton had been doing prior when they were approaching their flood mitigation opportunities. Um, and so what was happening in Edmonton um, is Primarily, they were looking at flood mitigation that only considered the first three boxes on the sheet. Um, so they were building new trunks, they were doing sewer separation in the combined sewer areas, they were adding new outfalls to the creeks and rivers, and they were building ponds um, and cha making changes to road grading. Uh, they had restricted, however, on the ponds that they were limiting themselves to only ones that could be two hectares in size or larger. So really not considering the fact of doing smaller or pocket ponds scattered throughout the community as, a, as an option. Um, when we started looking at what other cities were doing, we realized that we were missing a, a dimension of looking at our maintenance programs. So if you have an area that's at higher risk of flood, perhaps you go to a higher maintenance program for cleaning out of your catch basins, um, making sure that things are, are connected in a way that there's not going to be, an, if there's a, a bigger storm than you anticipated, it's not going to cause adverse flooding in an area. Uh, from an emergency response and weather forecasting, uh, a number of leading utilities and communities are starting to incorporate real smart time sensors uh, and real time controls in their sewer systems to manage the flows as the storms are coming across the city. So that was definitely something we wanted to include in our strategy going forward, taking advantage of the Internet of Things and, and where things were going. Uh, green infrastructure, low impact development was certainly something that uh, you know, a lot of communities have been talking about uh, and moving forward. And really, we're at a cusp of, of changing approaches to this. Um, some of the early low impact development, the first generation, was primarily focused on water quality improvements, but really the newer generation of techniques also provide peak flow mitigation. And so being able to understand which types of low impact development provide different types of functionality and how we could better incorporate them. 
Um, another big piece of low impact development, however, is the bulk of the available land space in a community is on the private side. And so what are different techniques that a municipality has to consider to encourage or invest in those type of uh, infrastructure investment, not within the public right of way, which is historically where the gray infrastructure that the utility invests in sits in. And then finally, the whole concept of flood proofing of properties was really important. Um, the number one thing you can do to protect a property from extensive damage is flood proof it. And so what are the programs that a municipality or utility can be in, um, encouraging and supporting to help ensure that homeowners are doing the best that they can on their side of the property to protect their, their investments? Another big part of our project um, is the city of Edmonton was also in parallel to that um, updating their climate change adaptation um, strategies. They are part of a group called the Covenant of Mayors. You'll find many municipalities are either part of the Rockefeller 100 or the Covenant of Mayors. Um, both of them are basically doing the same thing, which is adapting their communities uh, for climate change. And there's a number of different indicators and programs that to be a member of those communities um, you need to have um, completed within your organization. And so during that period, the city of Edmonton was hosting a number of different workshops where they brought in um, individuals from across the community in 17 different sectors, and then looked at a number of different hazard perils that could change due to climate change. Um, through that process, we looked at uh, what would be the impact of uh, direct damage, but also looked at service impacts and either indirect or direct service impacts. So explain a little bit about what that, uh, what those mean. So a direct damage would be, you know, a, a particular, a hospital is flooded. An indirect service impact is the parking lot to the hospital is flooded. Um, so you can't get to the hospital, but it's not damaged. Um, an indirect service impact is the freeway to the hospital is flooded. And so it impacts the ability for ambulances to get to, to the hospital. And so looking at those different dimensions, uh, considering the location as well as the, the infrastructure that's uh, peripheral to those critical pieces of infrastructure. And so out of that, the city of Edmonton uh, completed a citywide vulnerability risk assessment, identified what the five uh, top climate change risks were for Edmonton and initiatives are underway against all five of those right now to reduce and adapt and mitigate the city against them and certainly urban flooding and rivering flooding were two of those top risks uh, that as a community in Edmonton we needed to address and so um, I was able to take that work and the knowledge that I gained in terms of understanding the impacts to the different industry sectors of flooding and pull that into our integrated resource plan. In parallel to that, uh, I think I joined every single industry committee that was working on this topic across Canada. Uh, and so there are a number of initiatives underway right now, uh, a number of them sponsored through Insurance Bureau of Canada, um, also the INTAC Center on Climate Change Adaptation. They had a number of best practices, uh, guidelines and documents being developed. Um, the Canadian Water Network, um, the municipal consortium there, uh, that group is made up of basically the, um, the biggest cities across Canada. So although we have 24 members, we represent about 70% of the population of Canada. And so we were able to have a number of different sessions jointly with Insurance Bureau of Canada to talk about what are some of the challenges we're finding in big cities and how we can leverage the respective knowledge of both of our organizations to help adapt our communities. And then, of course, um, ongoing continued outreach with other communities across the globe in terms of what were some of the techniques they were seeing and best practices, so able to leverage all of that in. One of the initiatives that we did sponsor uh, with Insurance Bureau of Canada and Canadian Water Network and the federal government was to look at are there methods to improve uh, some of the flood hazard maps that the insurance sector had been developing through the, the addition of a uh, richer data from the various municipalities. And so out of that, uh, we did a participated in, in a pilot initiative with a number of communities bringing data in. And from that, we basically determined the number one priority. There was a yeah. point where Kristen went, she was drunk on vocal and she Oh, went, sorry, she somebody was, needs to mute. She Thank you. Um, so what we, one of the things that we did determine for that is that a real advantage would be the federal government could update the resolution of the topographical grid 
for all of Canada, that would probably have the biggest benefit uh, to everybody. And so we're continuing to advocate for that. Um, the insurance discussions though are still ongoing. Uh, they require a lot of different parties at play. And sometimes it's not a, just a simple answer of saying, oh, do this and then everything will be um, all resolved. And so uh, probably one of the big things is overland flood insurance is a new product in the market. It's really only been available since, um, you know, 2013, 2014 timeframe. But for example, in Alberta, only 50% of policy holders have actually added it to their policy. Um, we're also seeing the provincial and federal governments starting to tighten up on disaster recovery funding um, and eligibility for that. And so if you don't have insurance, you might not be eligible for funding. Um, in Alberta, they've just recently changed the policy that if you do get disaster recovery uh, support for the province, you can only do it once. Um, and so if you have a second flood, you're expected that you will have done something to adopt your, adapt your property to not require that funding in the future. Um, and so it is very much a, a very complex discussion. Um, so it's beyond the engineering. It, it's about governance. It's about economics. Um, it's about public policy it is out there. And so as, a, as engineers in our community, we need to be aware of these drivers because this is what our customers are experiencing and facing. And so we have to be there to support them. Um, this is a, a newer graphic um, that we created for our most recent presentation at Utility Committee in August and really trying to explain what's going on in the insurance space. And I'll just spend a little bit of time in, in the middle of the circle where we talk about, you know, you've got the municipality and the utility. Uh, they're, you know, basically in the community, they're looking at how to mitigate. They have the best understanding of risk. Then you've got your customers and in Edmonton, there's 360,000 of them. They're all at varying levels of risk and varying understanding of their risk. Now those customers are in individual conversations with their insurance brokers. And there's about 200 companies in Canada that offer insurance. And so it's a real mix match of, of different techniques. And the pricing for that insurance is gonna be based on all sorts of things, not just your flood risk. It's also, do you have a teenage son at home? Uh, how many cars do you have? What type of, do you have a wood frame home? All of those things come into your insurance price. And then finally, there's the hidden group, which are the reinsurers. And they're the, the people in the back office that are helping provide data to the brokers uh, so to help them price their policies. And there's very little relationship right now between the municipal utilities and the reinsurers. And so a lot of the committee work that I'm involved in right now is about how to bridge that gap so we're improving knowledge across. In parallel to that, we've got federal and provincial entities doing all sorts of research and providing data as well as industry advocacy groups. Um, so again, it's a very complex space, but there's lots of places to, to work at and, and tackle the problem. And it's really about building our communication channels. So how we did our actual project um, is we wanted to determine, as I said, our first objective was to figure out who was at risk in Edmonton. And so what we ended up doing is we took the entire city of Edmonton and broke it out. It actually ended up being about 1400 sub basins. And you can see on the map there what a sub basin is. It's, it's, it's basically a catchment area based on pipes. Um, if there was a topographical difference above that pipe network, then we subdivided the, the catchment into multiple basins. And then for each one of those basins, we looked at what would be the impact of flooding uh, based on different types of flooding around. So, and, and looked at it through the dimension of a health and safety lens. So is there a risk of someone drowning or being exposed to sanitary sewage and getting ill? Uh, is there an environmental impact in terms of erosion or release of sanitary sewage to the environment? Was there a social service impact? Is there a, a hospital or a school? Um, in that location, a senior center, um, and what would be the impact on the community if that service was not available. And then finally, we also looked at it from a financial damage perspective. And so depending on the depth of flooding, um, there's a certain, there's a whole bunch of curves out there that can tell you what the protect estimated damage is to a property. Um, and so really the purpose of this exercise was to get a, a risk framework in, in a way that we could move it forward. And I'll talk a little bit more about that going forward. The other piece we did that I think is a little unique compared to what other cities have typically done 
um, people are always talking about, you know, what storm should we design to? And through our um, engagement with the insurance sector, we quickly recognized that that's probably the wrong way to approach this. What we want to look at is the spectrum of storms that a property could be exposed to over the lifetime that someone would own that property. And so to explain that, on a one in 100 year storm, if you pick that as a design standard, that is you're saying in any one year, there's a 1% chance of a property being flooded that year. Well, just doing pure probability math, that means that over 30 years, there's a 26% chance of that property being flooded. And over 100 years, there's a 63% chance of that property being flooded. And so if you start thinking about a homeowner, they typically um, often do own their home for 30 years. And some of our institutional buildings have been in their locations for 100 years plus. And so if a property has a risk of flooding in that major storm, you maybe need to think a little bit different about just moving the water away at the 1 in 100, but what are other things we should be doing to protect that property? Um, also, we heard from the insurance that they tend to also go up to the one in 200 year storm and to look at their risk profiles. So for our project, we chose to include these five storms for every one of those basins and consider how the risk would change um, to the property across each of those, those storms and, and applied it into our likelihood framework. Uh, the other piece I would say with our initiative is it was a GIS exercise, not a modeling exercise. Uh, and so we did use uh, models, uh, but the output of the models is what really input into our GIS. This allowed us to bring together a number of different models that maybe didn't have full coverage of the city of Edmonton. And so what we would look at is if we had, you know, maybe five or six different studies for a particular location, we would go through those and figure out what was the one that was most pertinent for that area. Um, the other thing we were able to do is we purchased from the insurance sector the flood maps that they use. And so that gave us the overall coverage of the entire city. So worst case is the only uh, flood data we had was the insurance maps. But in most cases, we were able to supplement that with other data. We also were able to pull in things from our asset management information. So knowing um, you know, what is the, the condition of those assets, does that lead to a higher potential likelihood uh, of something not working correctly and moving forward? And then finally, um, the critical buildings, the social dimension, we leveraged that off the IPCC uh, recommended categories of the components in your community you should be paying extra attention to in, in the aspects of climate change. Uh, and so again, pulling lots of data together from different sectors and we continue to get new data. Uh, one of the data sets we're currently in the process of really building out is underground parkades uh, due to the higher risk of drowning uh, for, for customers and, and getting a sense of where those are located throughout our city. Another big piece of our work was the public opinion survey, and, and this is available on our website as well um, and was presented in the October um, 2018 presentation to the Utility Committee. Um, and so we did a very comprehensive survey uh, with um, using a professional surveying firm, went out to 1500 Ed Edmontonians, uh, made sure that the participants covered all of our demographic dimensions. So income level, type of housing, did they live in a high rise or a house, looked at age of housing, educational level, um, a number of different perspectives. Did they park in underground parkades, for example, and really asked them a number of different questions about flood um, mitigation and what would be the, if you had limited money, where would you invest your funds? So it's a max stiff survey. So you present an individual with five choices and you say for this much money, what would you prioritize first? What would you prioritize last? And then you, you iterate through that numerous times. Um, each participant spent about 35 minutes in the survey and we feel the accuracy is within 2% of our demographics of Edmonton. Um, and so just to give an example of, of what some of the questions would be, so we would say um, there's been extreme flooding at Edmonton, you have two inches of water or two feet of, wa of water in your basement, um, your elderly parents have been displaced from their seniors residence and now have to live with you for the next two months, uh, the underpass is flooded so your commute time is doubled, 
Uh, there's been a, a major erosion event, so the trail system is no longer functional. So those were the types of scenarios we presented. We did not present, should we protect to a one in 100 year for flood or a one in 50 year flood? We really tried to make the statements about what would the impacts be and, and trying to pull out the value to the community. Uh, and so out of that, um, we heard loud and clear from Edmonton um, that the, really the top priorities for Edmonton when it came to flood mitigation was making sure that the hospitals and essential services remained functional during a flooding event. Um, anything where there was a risk to human life also scored quite high, so risk of drowning, risk of illness, and anything that impacted the social service agencies that were going to be there to help with the flood mitigation. After that is when the financial damages started to come into play in terms of prioritization. And so this is really important because prior to us doing this survey, everything was about the financial damages and, and who should invest and who pays. But when you start to add the dimension of the fabric of your community and how it can be impacted by flooding, it starts to help you to prioritize what efforts and, and initiatives you're putting forward. It was important for us in Edmonton because underpass flooding was a very major concern for us. And often it wasn't getting the attention that it should because there was no physical damage during that event. But what was happening was a very high risk of someone drowning. And so the solution maybe is not to stop the underpass from flooding, it's to stop the risk of people drowning. And so we're introducing uh, traffic control devices uh, to basically, um, if the underpass is shown as flooding, we divert traffic to a different um, route. So we're achieving our objective of reducing what the risk factor is for that location. So pulling all that information together, we ended up with a series of maps and risk grids um, that basically looked across the city at what were the risk dimensions of health and safety, environmental risk, financial risk, and social risk uh, across the entire city. And so what the grids are showing, um, each of the colored dots represent a different storm, the one in 20 up to the one in 200. Each dot represents a, a sub basin under that storm. And then the map is showing the areas of the city that have impacts across multiple storms. We also can produce the maps individually for each storm. And I wanna highlight this because we were able to use similar data to provide two dimensions of risk. So health and safety and financial risk both leveraged the depth of flooding. Uh, but the health and safety risk was about the risk of drowning versus the financial risk was the number of properties uh, that were going to be damaged. And so we were able to use the same data set and interpret two dimensions of risk. Similarly, health and safety and environment in terms of spills of sewage into the environment, we were able to use it against two dimensions. And the social risk applied if there was any of the other three risks and one of those social businesses in that location. So we have a very rich data source here. And so as we move forward and implement our improvements, we're basically going to be shuffling these dots down into the lower uh, left corner through incremental improvements to get rid of the risk that we have. And as you can see, our health and safety uh, risks are some of our highest risk along with financial. And so those are the ones to, to focus on, but we also have environmental and social risks that we can address. Now we also had to bring it all back together. So we looked at it uh, separate, but then we were able to use our public engagement work to weight uh, the individual risks together. And so when we did that, uh, we, we looked at health and safety and the social dimension as having a higher weighting than financial than environment. Um, through that, we basically ended up with a, a priority list. Um, the top 200 sub-basins are pretty much the same, however you weight it but it does give you a little bit of a dimension to move it forward. And that big blue blob that's sort of in, in the middle of the, of, of the system, so sort of right here, is an interesting one because um, out of that, we've got a creek which has some environmental concerns. We have a combined sewer system, so there's higher risk of, of flooding. And we also have a ton of seniors facilities uh, in that location. And so it kind of highlighted that there's a, a more vulnerable population in that location that we need to think about as we move forward. 
so once we had this approved to our utility committee, we then had to go back and say, okay, what do we need to do in order to reduce these risks across the community? And so a number of us uh, went back, looked at a number of our previous studies and work that had been done previously in terms of recommendations to see what we could prioritize. But we also going back into that toolkit of other options that we could implement uh, across the city, how could we balance those across the community? So through that uh, piece, we ended up um, organizing our effort into these five major themes of slow, move, secure, predict, respond. Um, often municipalities will talk about the slow and the move, the gray versus the green uh, perspective. But what we found is by us including the dimensions of secure, which is the flood proofing of property, making sure water is not going to somewhere where it's gonna cause damage, uh, the predict using sensors to, to better manage our system and respond, beefing up our emergency response protocols, we could actually have a more fulsome um, investment uh, theme that would, would balance and deal with the highest risks first as, as we go forward in terms of limiting damage. Um, I want to also touch a little bit on as we were going through our work, we, we did come across a couple of themes that I think are also important to understand. So the first one is we put all our data together, we started to realize that the increased risk to basement flooding is less about the pipe network and more about where water is ponding on the surface. And so um, the little map on the, on the left is showing um, from the insurance maps, the green is a one in 1500 storm, so a really extreme storm. The pink is a one in 100. And the little white dots are 20 years of our records of basement flooding. And so you can start to see some clustering happening around that surface ponding. And so out of that, what we, we basically determined is that an extended period of surface ponding, that water is gonna find any crack it can find to migrate into the property over the time that it's ponding. And it's less about um, the pipe because, you know, adjacent to those sag areas, the pipes and the infrastructure are the same vintage, the houses are the same vintage, but we still see the clustering. And so this big dot up at the top here is actually interesting because it's an old lake bed that was paved over in the 1930s, McKernan Lake. You can, you can find photos of, of people ice skating on it, but uh, in the 1930s, they converted that into a subdivision. Uh, but the water still remembers that there's a lake there. And so in an extreme storm, it's gonna try and get there. Um, this particular area, there's no flooding in this location because it's a schoolyard and we've just commissioned a new dry pond uh, for that location. And then similar in here, it's another schoolyard that we've added a dry pond into, but a very interesting finding and, and really drives us to, to really focus on the topographical sags as a way of, of managing water and slowing the water getting to that location. The other big uh, finding for us is we looked at sort of the storm patterns in Edmonton and how are they actually manifesting across the city and you know typical hydraulic models uh, when you're doing your pipe design you you assume your storms are circles of perfect intensity and that's really not how the storm comes across the city um, and so the figure on the left uh, and here is our uh, a one in 200 year storm that we had in the Edmonton region. There was extensive flooding in, in this area of the city. I, I live right here and I can attest that I had water in my condo. Um, but what was interesting with this storm is we also had extensive underpass flooding on this freeway over here, but looking at it from a storm intensity, that was really a one in five year storm. So what was happening in this area here is that our pipe network was actually collecting that storm, that low intensity storm and shunting it to the underpasses. And so this is where the green infrastructure components really start to come into play. And so as we looked at the different green steering, um, infrastructure and how much water it could capture during different storm intensities, we recognize that a wide scale implementation of green infrastructure that was capturing the one in five and one year two and two year storm could have a substantial impact on the flooding risks in the community. So it's a much longer rollout for that. And um, having come from the water sector, I say it's very analogous to the early days of water conservation when we were trying to push toilets uh, all across the city. It's, it's the same sort of perspective we need to take with the green infrastructure is that on a parcel by parcel basis, we're capturing and reducing that peak flow out of the system. 
Um, so how do this, the different techniques compare? And so I think this is where the, the big part. So traditional master planning is on the left. And so the city of Edmonton had done a lot of work looking at it, you know, considering those three boxes that they said they had limited their solutions to. And really they were trying to pick a storm. So the, is it that one in 100 year or the one in 50 bigger or smaller storms? And really they were looking at a range of 4.6 to $2.2 billion worth of investment and thinking it was gonna take about 80 years to do it. So they were gonna basically replicate the freeway system with a large underground pipe system uh, with some major ponds. By us looking at it through an IRP lens and trying to understand really what is happening and, and reducing the peak, adding the secure and the predict pieces to manage those flows, we were able to come up with a, an investment strategy of $1.6 billion that we can complete in 20 years. So it's a much faster and much cheaper approach to achieve the same benefit, which is what the integrated resource plan objective is, is why are we doing this project is to reduce the risk of damage of flooding. And we can achieve that through a different mix of investments. Um, so next slide. Um, but it doesn't come with just capital. And so this is one of the things, uh, you know, traditional master planning, you do the capital, you build it, and you forget about it. Um, but IRP and the techniques we're talking about here actually require operational investments. And so we had to improve our maintenance programs on some of our systems. One of the things we discovered is that our ditches and swales, nobody was maintaining them. Um, they had been only dealt with on a complaint basis. And so we've been going through the process of inspecting all the culverts, making sure they're functional. We now have an annual maintenance program to manage vegetation. Um, on the controls pieces, um, the entire system of stormwater in Edmonton had 400 sensors for 6,000 kilometers of pipe. Uh, and so we are building that up with enough sensors so that again, we can control and manage the flows in real time. And um, a really good example of a, a community that's done that is South Bend, Indiana. Uh, they, they've probably got the best case study of how they've leveraged that in. And then finally, we really beefed up our backwater valves and home flood proofing program. We've doubled the number of staff that are in there to support um, homeowners figuring out what they need to do for flood proofing. And we have increased subsidies. <laughs> So, oh, somebody needs to mute. <laughs> um, and so finally, um, in terms of the financial considerations, there were a couple things we needed to sort out again, a capital versus operating expense. Uh, we are looking at alternative rate structures for our next rate filing. Um, also a little bit about who pays. So traditionally, because stormwater was primarily a piped uh, system, only people that were adjacent to a pipe. Uh, paid into the stormwater rate. And now that we're taking a more holistic view and looking at the natural infrastructure and maintaining those ditches and swales, uh, we need to look beyond just the pipe, uh, the people next to a pipe pain. Um, looking at, you know, if we're installing green infrastructure on private property, how do we pull all those pieces together? Um, and how do, as a utility, if we invest in something on private property, make sure it doesn't get ripped out with the next owner and, and that it's still there in service. So a lot of those dimensions we're still continuing to explore and work through, uh, but those are all the pieces. Um, I'm going to stop here and ask if there are any questions. Um, I do have other slides if there's details on a, on a particular type of investment, but generally this is usually where I stop and uh, take any questions on our program. Thank you very much, Suzanne. It was very, it's a very comprehensive uh, activity going on there. Uh, thank yeah. you very much for sharing that with us. Uh, so um, uh, questions, um, as always, you can ask questions using the chat window or just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask. Well, people are thinking. Um, so, uh, one technical question How did you model LID impacts? Uh, so, what we did is we had um, Edmonton had actually identified, I think, 12 different types of LID that could be installed in the community. We took a second sweep through those to find the ones that also could provide peak flow. Uh, mitigation, because that was really our priority. It was not just the water quality aspects, but also the peak flow uh, dimension. And so we we focused, ended up focusing initially on four types. 
uh, so tree cells, box planters, um, bioretention, and rain gardens, because all of those had a storage component. We also looked at green roofs, but um, they're not part of our plan right now because there's so much on the private side and tied to structural issues, but they are certainly a, another dimension. Um, we did um, really look to Philadelphia and New York, who are quite a bit further ahead on this and both of them have a performance measure called a greened acre. Uh, we've adapted it as a greened hectare, uh, but basically what you do is you look at the storage component of that green infrastructure, spread that out at a depth, we, we're using 15 millimeters and however many hectares that depth covers is, is called the green hectare. And so our performance target is to achieve a certain number of green hectares over the next 20 years. And our goal is around 30,000 green hectares um, throughout the, the community. So it's a fairly large investment. Um, in terms of where we figured out where we put it, we looked at the SAGs and said, okay, our, our objective with the green infrastructure is to keep that water from getting to that SAG location. And so our initial days are prioritized around that. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question from me. Um, so could you please explain a little bit more on how can funds only you adjacent to that? Yeah, so yeah. you have to look at the rate models that are used in different communities. And it is interesting, like stormwater historically has been funded through the tax roll, but some communities have it on as a separate utility. Uh, Edmonton was one of the early ones to, to do that program. I think Winnipeg as well. Um, and the way those programs were built and partially due to the generation of when they were built, you have to think about the data that a utility would have had. So at the time that that utility was first put in, the only people that we had a relationship with were the people that we sold water to. Uh, and so we would have had um, typically a pipe solution to them. Some of the other communities that have implemented stormwater um, rates since then, they are, um, they, they are able to do more of a land-based approach. Uh, but us as a utility, we don't have a relationship with every property owner in the city, the city does. And so us thinking about how would we get them into an account when they're not currently in account uh, to us. So it, rate design is a whole other topic in itself. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the University of North Carolina has a lot of really, their environmental sustainability center has a ton of great references and documents on rate design uh, to consider. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I see a question, we looked at replacing credential stormwater ponds. They actually are two different components. Um, and so the large stormwater ponds, um, we have both wet and dry ponds uh, that we've got in there. And then we have the LID component. The ponds, some, the big ponds are more about the big storm. And so we expect them to fill and drain during those major storms. Um, certainly in our CERT predict strategy, we're gonna be managing those water levels. The, the LIDs are more about capturing the small storms. And so we think of the storm uh, pattern hitting the city, you've got your major storm coming through. And what we're doing is with the LIDs is reducing the extra noise that's coming into that path by holding it back. And so you need both really to, to pull it together. One of the things we are looking at for greenfield development, um, historically they've been predominantly doing wet ponds in Greenfield and we're thinking we can do an LID dry pond uh, combination that would be just as effective from a water quality perspective without taking up as much land space that the wet ponds do. So it gives a, a better, a, a more variety for the developers to work with. We'll see if there are any other so, questions. Susan, there was um, the, the, in Calgary flooding, uh, there were also houses that were impacted by groundwater flow. Uh, do you have this kind of uh, flood type in, in Edmonton? And how do you do it? Yeah, not so much from the, the deeper, um, I, I guess, flood risk. So Calgary was primarily a, a, a riverine flooding risk and Edmonton's risk is primarily urban flooding. So pluvial flooding mm -hmm. risk. We have some areas of the river valley, but it, it, I think it's about 300 homes in total are in our, our river valley risk. So it's a much different dimension uh, between Edmonton and Calgary for riverine flooding. Um, from the groundwater piece, what we are finding um, is we have certain areas of the city where the groundwater is being pumped into the sanitary system. Uh, 
uh, underneath home foundations. And so that's one that I think um, we're going to be chasing down. So part of our um, inflow infiltration reduction exercises, and it's actually we're in the process of developing a sanitary IRP. So using a similar technique, but looking at the sanitary system and seeing about techniques to get extra water that's hitting the sanitary system, as well as waste characterization, because um, water conservation is actually resulting in more solids in the sewer systems, which is leading to corrosion erosion and odors and, and all that. So unintended consequences of a really successful IRP on water is resulting in damage to the sanitary system. And so now we're trying to pull all the IRPs together into a comprehensive view by region of the city. And so groundwater is definitely a component of inflow infiltration um, that we, we wanna manage better, but it's more on the sanitary IRP that it will, will fall out. Thank you. So two, two questions from Reza and Ramsey. Um, so let me just hear. So the cost of LID um, business case for private sector to implement. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the private sector for implementing IT. So what we did, which is very different than other communities, we're gonna do the investment as the utility for it. So a lot of utilities will try and do things like rate incentives and try and get the business to, you know, this is a good thing, you should do this. The challenge is the economics don't work. The, the cost of the LID typically requires a 30 to 40 year payback. And so for a business, they're typically not going to do that, especially if it's a commercial business, they're probably looking for more of five year payback. Um, on a residential side, um, the stormwater rate on a residential bill is nine dollars. Um, there's not a lot of incentive to get them to do a you know a five hundred dollar rain garden uh, in their thing. So so we've through our process have identified that we will do the investment on that property as opposed to trying to to nudge someone along through a rate investment. And so that's why I'm focusing more on the instrument to make sure that if we make that investment, they don't rip it out. And that it's still going to be functional. So it's 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 a little bit different approach. It's about policy um, and governance. Um, now to do that type of investment on private property, you have to have, have the comparison of the public investment. So if I were to only be able to do that on the public side, what would that infrastructure cost be? And I have that in the 4.6 to 2.2 billion. I can show that this is the lower cost investment to the rate payer that I'm allowed to invest on private property. Uh, in terms of the cost per LID, it really depends on the type of LID. And so we're in the process right now of building basically a catalog of LID types with different costs. And sometimes it's more the urban form that will push you into a particular type. So if you've got very small light lines and risk of foundation, you're gonna be looking at more box planters, um, which have a, a different cost. Uh, tree cells are a slightly higher cost, but they work in a smaller footprint. Um, and so it, it's really about having a catalog of, of options for you. Um, and really, I, I, again, having come from the water conservation side, and the early days of toilets and all the crazy things we did to toilets to make them efficient. Uh, the first few years were a little painful and probably more costly, but once we kind of got through it, it's now impossible to get a water um, um, wasting toilet or a water wasting dishwasher in there. You'd have to work really hard to, to use that type of, of water. And so my, my big goal is that the LID should be as easy to pick out as a catch basin. It's just a natural piece that you're adding into your system and you you really don't need to think about it but it's going to take a few years of production to get there thank you um so you asked me about uh, being in council quite a bit um yeah so i think um I, a couple of things. So being friends to council was great because we were able to sort of test our processes because we, we were, this is a completely new way of thinking. Uh, and so being able to go in, in front of them. Um, city council typically would not get involved in the weeds of what design works versus the other. And so one of the things that I am doing out of this project is doing lectures just like this. Um, and so I've been going into the consulting firms and doing two hour detailed design lectures on how does this different technique think? Cause it's really changing the traditional way that we design our systems and starting to think about it. It's less about, okay, this is a storm. I apply it to the pipes. Here's the size of the pipe and I get it to the river. Now you're starting to think about, okay I need to change the inputs into that pipe. 
you're starting to talk about urban form challenges, lot grading, that kind of stuff. And then you're starting to more work more with the planners, um, the economists, the ecologists, the parks department. And those are groups that the drainage utility is the deepest utility typically doesn't spend a lot of time with. Um, and so I, I remember talking to one uh, person from Roadways and I, I, is a, it's a quote that really stuck with me because he said, quit trying to put wedding cake on the road. Um, and that's how he described LID. It was this really complex thing you were putting in. There's no way we can maintain it. Um, in the winter, it's going to get destroyed when we pile the snow on it. Um, he goes, I want bread. And so I walked away from that meeting thinking about it. And I, I thought, you know, in my life, um, I've baked more cakes than bread. And why is that? Because cake comes in a standard recipe. I add three eggs, a quarter cup of oil, put it in the oven for 350 for 20 minutes. We don't have LID at that stage yet, where it's as easy as, as bread. Um, and also I think we have a mismatch in our priorities. So from a storm perspective, we're focused on the summer storms. From a roads perspective, they're focused on the winter and the freeze thaw cycles. And so they're very concerned about LID resulting in more ice on sidewalks. Is there increased liability of traffic accidents? Is someone gonna fall and break their leg? And so we have to be cognizant of that as we work through these designs and thinking about those dimensions that it's not just about the summer, but it's also about the winter. And so that's an, an IRP technique as well as to think about the full seasonality of what you're putting in there and, and something that may be really good for one season may be really bad for another. And so a lot of the solutions that we picked have been focused on finding those ones that cross the seasons. Thank you very much. I just want to highlight that um, uh, all the students who have classes uh, are welcome mm -hmm. to leave. They can leave, uh, I know they, yeah. uh, so you don't have to really understand. I don't take uh, attendance. Um, but um, if, if you agree, Susan, we have a couple of more questions. And uh, Yeah, so in terms of ownership and maintenance, um, it's, it's a little bit of that's something we're still working through. Our objective is to pick um, LIDs that are lower maintenance, so not the wedding cake um, solutions, so natural plants, um, ones that, it, and then basically we've hired additional operational staff to maintain the underdrain systems. And so that's coordinated with our ditches and swells program that we added as well. Um, but it, it really is about a balance of working in the community. And it is a new space for the drainage utility because we're up at the surface and, and we've traditionally not been there. Um, so even thinking about how we commission this infrastructure, um, historically drainage is the first utility in the subdivision. You put that in there and then basically we put the green infrastructure in at that same time, all the home builders would destroy it when they're building their houses. And so you, now you have a situation where drainage has to come in twice into the neighborhood. You come in first with your pipes and then you come in at the tail end at, after a certain number of the homes have been built to implement the green infrastructure so it's not destroyed. So it's, it's governance, policy, procedures, much broader dimension than the engineering. And uh, just being from academia, uh, I'm just wondering if there are data related to the LID effectiveness mm -hmm. that can be analyzed. So what I would say, and it was one of my pet peeves, is I would look at all this LID literature out there and it was all like, it will do this for water quality, this much phosphorus is removed, or this is this. And it's also good for flood mitigation. And that was the extent of the rest of it. And it is also good for flood mitigation. I think I only found one resource from the University of Virginia that had actually done the peak flow attenuation analysis of the LID they were voting. So that is the big gap. Um, and so us starting to understand um, as these different LID techniques are, are considered, if we could start to standardize that capture of flow off across the spectrum of storms. And so we say we put in this LID, it can capture 100% of the five year storm, 10% of the, the 100 year storm and 20% of, of this storm. That would be really valuable in terms of moving us forward to this being as easy to pick out as a catch basin. And it, it, it truly is not there yet. Okay. Uh, great. Um, just checking to make sure all mm -hmm. questions are answered. Uh, okay, there's one question. I'm not sure if you addressed that already, but about the cost of LID with respect to other mitigation measures. Um, I, I guess my question would say is to not look at it that way. Um, and I think a lot of people have done that, particularly when they're comparing gray and green. 
Uh, so the pipes versus the LID, you'll, you'll find a lot of people have gone that direction. The way I look at it is it's gray infrastructure versus the green infrastructure plus the secure, plus the predict, plus the respond. Um, and so you bring that family of, of the interventions together, um, it, it actually makes it make sense. And I, I'm really not focusing so much on that. Um, also, because we are in a transition phase for LID, I anticipate it's gonna be more expensive, just like the early days of toilets were more expensive uh, until we, we rationalize through this phase. Uh, but based on the storm patterns, it's an important component to there, but it's, a, it's different than the way we design systems now. And I'm just thinking about considering impacts of climate change, increases in rainfall. LID is just a measure that is uh, more resilient. Uh, it's more resilient. It, it's, you're, you're shedding off the peaks uh, yeah. around there. Um, the other thing that you know was really interesting when I acquired the insurance maps and, and the work that we did with CWN and, and IBC show that the insurance maps are, are, I mean, you wouldn't design off them, but they are sufficient enough for prioritization. Uh, in there and the geographic for pluvial flooding in particular, so urban flooding, the geographical difference between a one in 1500 year storm and a one in 20 year storm is not that big um, because the urban form holds so much water. Uh, and so if you start thinking about flood proofing in there, um, somewhere between the one in 20 and the one in 1500 is climate change. And so if I'm looking at that dimension, I, I've, I've already got it covered by thinking about from a flood proofing perspective. Mm -hmm. Where it comes critical is when you're designing your big ponds, then you start to, to be more concerned about that and, and some of the trunks to move water to and from the ponds. But for those other solutions, it's about you're in a high risk area. It's just similar if you were in a wildfire in proximity to a stand of trees. Think of it that same dimension. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Suzanne. It was a very interesting mm -hmm. talk. Uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, and I hope you can uh, have some time to give other talks in the future as well. Yeah, no, as we develop our sanitary IRP, I think that's, uh, it's very interesting what we're finding. Like we're looking at um, classifying our wastewater and saying, can we do something with the food energy nexus? And so do we accept the overstrength from the food waste? Could we do start to do stuff where we make the food producers and do on-site treatment of that to avoid that risk of that, that waste, plugging the sewers and making it more difficult to treat at the centralized plant. Those are the kind of things we're doing with our sanitary IRP. So it's very interesting stuff uh, coming forward out of that. And so all the IRPs, will be completed end of next year. Um, and we'll have that full dimensional, one water dimension view of, of infrastructure in our community. That's wonderful. And by the way, are, are those uh, available publicly on reports, like the reports documents, are they like on your webpage? To so for the, to for the SERP reports, if you Google EPCOR flood mitigation, you'll get to our page and we'll get to those reports. Mm -hmm. You can also look at the City of Edmonton Utility Committee our city council meetings and look at the utility committees based on those months mm -hmm. uh, that I had in my presentation. That will get you to those reports, plus the slide decks, plus mm -hmm. you can listen to me talk about each one of those topics for 20 minutes uh, in more detail and the Q&A with our councillors out of each report. So there's, there's much more rich, richness on the city of Edmonton's council page. Mm -hmm. Great, that's wonderful. Awesome, thank you very much again. Hey. Thanks for inviting me. And hopefully as you guys are going forward with your engineering career, you think about IRP techniques as yeah, a different sure. way to solve problems. Cause I think that's where we're gonna go going forward. Yeah, for sure. Great, thanks much. Have a great day. Have a great yeah, day. Thanks everybody. everyone. Bye. Bye.